Hi everyone, we are delighted to have buried and thought leaders joining us. They are Darren Asimoglu from MIT, who's going to share with us his work on the future of work under the threat of AI and excessive automation. Joshua Gans will be uh, the discussion. He's from the University of Toronto. We do have a slightly different format today. Instead of focusing on a single paper, Darren's talk will be based on three well-received studies he has. Darren will still have 30 minutes for the presentation. After 15 minutes or so, he'll stop and um, take any clarification questions from the audience before continuing. After that, Joshua has 20 minutes for his discussion and will have an opportunity to offer his perspectives on future research in this field as well. Afterwards, we open the floor for questions from the audience. Now to our audience, please submit your questions in the Q&A box. I will then read your questions and directly or directly call upon you during the Q&A. The presentation and discussion will be recorded and together with the slides will be posted on our website. After the main part of the webinar, we will have about another 15 minutes of unrecorded discussion where everyone in the audience will have the chance to join us as panelists. So Darren, the floor is yours. And if you can Thank share you. your slides. Thank you, Will. And thanks uh, uh, <coughs> everybody, uh, Mariam, Svetlana, Marcus for the invitation and everybody for joining. Uh, <coughs> it's my pleasure to be talking about uh, uh, the, talking about some of my work on this topic to an audience who cares deeply about AI and its applications and is very knowledgeable. So I can actually sort of straight jump into the, uh, the issues at hand. So uh, I think it will be no surprise to people in this room that AI has tremendous promise, but there also, there's also quite a bit of apprehension about some of its effects perhaps less emphasized in some quarters uh, is how we can adapt to a new labor market after the effects of AI. There's quite a bit of work written on this, but I want to offer somewhat of a different perspective and, uh, and then tie it to some broader issues of adaptation to AI uh, and as well as excessive automation in that context. So uh, let me start with some facts that probably many of you are quite familiar with. In many countries, especially in the US, there has been a tremendous shift against labor and in favor of capital. This has major implications for national income, for finance, for investment, and of course, for wages inequality and so on. So here I'm showing in gray, the aggregate labor share in national income and in red, the composition adjusted version of it. And in both cases, you see an almost 10 percentage point decline from 2000 to today. That's a fairly large decline, almost unheard of in the in stable economies. This can have many causes, capital deepening, markups, monopsony, other technological aspects, but I'm gonna argue that it is intimately linked to the changing task content of production, which automation is one driver. But also I will say that, I will try to make the case that some of it is excessive, meaning that this automation and changes in task contents are going beyond what's efficient. Most of this is not caused by AI. You see an AI sort of uh, resurgence in the US in terms of firms investment and uh, and use of AI around 2015, really 2016, 2017. But I'm going to argue that AI is a continuation of these trends that were spearheaded by other technologies. I want to emphasize that this is not just capital versus labor, it's all about inequality as well. So these facts are also probably well known to most of you. Uh, what you see here is that wage inequality in the US has exploded. And I'm depicting that by showing the evolution of real wages, cumulative real wage changes from 1963 onwards for 10, 
10 demographic groups by education, all the way from workers with postgraduate degrees to workers without a high school degree and by gender. And you see that in the 1960s and early 70s, and also the same is true in the 1950s, these groups have very commensurate changes in their real wages, about, about 2% a year, really sort of a period of a rising tide lifting all boats. But then from around late 1970s or 1980 here, you have a sea change. First, you have this fanning out a much greater level of inequality. Second, median wages or even the wages of fairly well-educated workers, this light blue is men with, uh, uh, with a college degree but no postgraduate degree are stagnating. And as a result of the first two, actually the real wages of lower education groups such as workers with high school degree or less than high school uh, are falling quite, quite significantly. For women, it's a little bit less pronounced, but qualitatively the same. This is not a completely US specific phenomenon, although minimum wages, collective bargaining and social norms being different in many other countries, including Canada and uh, much of Europe, you don't see similar declines at the bottom of the distribution. Inequality as a whole has increased pretty much everywhere in the OECD. US is a leader in inequality, a dubious title, but it is. And it has had perhaps the largest increase in inequality. But many other countries have had significant ones as well. Moreover, the nature of these changes, which I'm going to link to automation, are also similar across countries. Here, I'm showing data based on my work with David Otter, in turn based on work by Goose, Manning, and Salomons about changes in the occupation distribution across countries from the early 1990s to just before the Great Recession. The uh, mahogany reddish thing here is change in the share of middle class, middle wage occupations, the middle third of the occupations in terms of wages or skills would be the same. And you see that those occupations, which are made up of things like blue collar workers, clerical workers, office retail workers, sales workers are declining pretty much everywhere. Some places they are replaced, especially if there's educational upgrading by more skilled higher wage occupations such as technicians. But in many places, including the US, it's a more bipolar situation where these middle occupations are swept some of them are swept into lower wage occupations such as custodial, home care, food preparation, and so on. So I think to understand these trends, what they mean for the future, their efficiency implications, and broader policy implications, we need to have a framework for thinking about how and why this is happening. And any framework would start with a production function, and economists would normally posit a production function like this say for output is equal in a sector at an economy level, some function of L tie L and K, capital and labor, and labor has a productivity AL, capital has a productivity AK. This is what you know, we would use in finance, in labor, in macro, in public finance, and so on. And it's very, very common. Essentially, all production functions you would see in introductory macro courses or even second year macro courses would take this form. And mia culpa, this is exactly what you would see in the 900 pages of my introduction to economic growth book, which was written about 20 years ago. But in the meantime, uh, I have come to believe that for many of the questions that we care about, this production function doesn't really provide a good approximation. And therefore using it not only leads to some incorrect comparative statics, but also makes us misidentify the nature of the problem. And at the root of the issue is that this production function doesn't really incorporate how the task structure, task content of production is changing. And automation is at heart about changing task content because it takes some of the tasks that were previously performed by labor and reallocates them to machines or algorithms. This is true in finance when some of the financial analysis tasks are taken away from uh, semi-skilled or skilled operatives to algorithms. It's true on the factory floor when uh, welding machine, uh, uh, automatic welding machines or robots take over uh, humans that were doing the welding with more basic machine tools. This is not something that's new. The 
beginning of the Industrial Revolution in Britain, it, starting in the middle of the 18th century, was all about substitution of machines for the skills of artisans and weaving and spinning first, but then in other sectors. And it has continued apace with big mechanization in agriculture with horse-powered reapers, harvesters, threshing machines, later tractors, machine tools replacing labor-intensive artisanal techniques throughout the 20th century, industrial robotics, as I've mentioned, and software automated routine tasks being performed by increasingly by specialized software starting from sometime in the late 1970s, early, uh, early 1980s. AI, in some sense, is or could be a continuation for that. Well, I'm going to talk about how else we can think about AI. So what's wrong in trying to think about these trends using this production function? Well, what's wrong is, I'm going to try to explain, is both substantive incorrect comparative statics in a way that I'm going to try to make it precise. But secondly, also descriptively, this production function really doesn't capture the essence of the problem at hand. And one issue which I'm going to explain is that here, by having this AL and AK, you are thinking that all technological changes make workers more productive, so therefore complementary to workers or complementary to other factors like capital directly. And at the same time, they tend to make capital and labor more productive uniformly, or I would say uniformly in all tasks. Both of those actually have fundamental implications. And they are linked to the comparative statics that I'm going to single out as being very important, which is whether technological progress benefits labor or not. So if you write a production function like this, uh, it's unless you have extreme uh, parameter values, both AK and AL increases will benefit labor. But what I'm going to show you is that once you go to a more general way of thinking about production process, increases in automation often tend to harm labor, not help labor. So, okay, let's try to make sense. And this is the only slide that has a little bit of math here, or actually two slides that have only a little bit of math. But it's very familiar looking math because everybody's here is sort of very, uh, 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 very familiar with CES production functions. But here I'm changing what that CES refers to. I'm thinking of a single sector, a single economy producing output Y. But what the CES does is that it combines task services according to the range of tasks which are normalized to one, Y it goes from N minus one to N, I'll explain in a second. And sigma is the elasticity of substitution between tasks. The key is this equation here in the middle. It says that tasks can be produced either by capital or labor. Tasks between I and sorry, between uh, I and N, some threshold I and the upper integral N, are non-automated tasks, so you cannot produce them anything by anything other than labor. So productivity of labor, I allow for this labor augmenting term to show you what it does. AL, LZ is the amount of labor assigned to that task, and gamma LZ is the task-specific productivity of labor in that task. Tasks between n minus one and i are technologically automated, so they can be produced by capital or labor. So gamma k, just like gamma l, is the productivity of capital in that task. So how gamma l over gamma k changes is the comparative advantage. And now you can see there's a richer menu of technological changes here. There's al and ak as before. These task specific productivities can change. In addition, you have I changing, which is the extensive margin of automation. Tasks that we could not perform before with machines or algorithms can now be automated. And N introduces new tasks. Now, try, let me try to explain why, where the importance of these assumptions lies, lies and why it has, it has implications for things like wages and uh, effects of technology on labor. So one way of visualizing this is to put the tasks on the horizontal axis and the cost of production of these tasks on the vertical axis. So this is, for example, W, the wage rate, divided by the productivity of labor in that task, same thing for capital. In this example, you automate all of these tasks. They go to capital, all of those go to labor. So let's now, using this figure, try to understand what these labor augmenting and capital augmenting technologies do. So if I increase AL here, that will shift this curve down. That's one form of technological progress. I have cost savings given by this blue area. 
Now, what's remarkable here is that labor augmenting technological change makes labor more productive in all tasks. What that does is that it creates a huge amount of productivity effect because labor is becoming more productive in all inframarginal tasks. And productivity is good for labor. So if you keep the, I'll emphasize again in two slides, if you keep the labor share constant, an increase in productivity implies a direct increase in the wage or employment. So productivity effect is always good for labor. And this generates a huge amount of productivity effect because we are modeling technology as directly increasing productivity of labor. Same thing if you have capital augmenting technology. It's now given by the red area, again, a huge productivity effect. But now let's look at something that actually changes the task content of production, which means that it reallocates tasks from one factor to another. Let's focus on automation. That would be a shift in this threshold from I to I prime. And what it would do is that it would take these tasks between these two lines and it would give them to capital rather than labor. This creates a direct displacement effect. These workers are now displaced from the tasks that they were performing. In addition, it still pro pro uh, generates a productivity effect. But the productivity effect now given something like a Haberger triangle. In particular, if you shift this orange curve a little bit up, you can make this green area trivially small. In fact, I'll show you later, you can make it negative also. So the productivity effect is actually potentially quite small. So while these types of technological changes are all about productivity, and in this example, I haven't even shifted this realloc allocation of tasks, so it's really just about productivity. Here, it's gonna be much more about displacement and much less about productivity. And then finally, new tasks, you just add new tasks here, so that can create both large productivity effects depending on the functional forms, and also potentially big reallocation because you're not creating new tasks. So the share of tasks that go to capital is going to decline. The share of tasks that go to labor is going to increase. Now, if you aggregate this model and solve it up, this is how you can write output as a function of the supply of labor and supply of capital. Now, when you first look at this, it might look like a CES production function. In fact, with AK to the, to K to the power sigma minus one over sigma, et cetera. So you might say, well, okay, You've described something that starts from micro foundations, but it's going to have exactly the same implications as a standard plain vanilla CES. But actually that appearance is deceptive. This is not a CES production function. And there are two reasons for that. One is that in the CES, this orange terms here would be a constant. Often we set it equal to one. Here now it's endogenous and most of the action takes place here in these orange terms. So in particular, changes in I and N, as you can see, as the limits of these integrals are going to shift those orange terms around. Second, in fact, the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor is not sigma. Why? Because the elasticity of substitution would be sigma holding the orange term constant, but there is substitution within the orange terms in general. As a result, if you look at the labor share, the key object that I started with, you can see that it really has two components the blue and the orange components. The blue components is again what you get from the neoclassical production function. Labor share depends on the elasticity of substitution, the wage and factor augmenting technology. This I would say in general, even though we emphasize this a lot in papers and in, in textbooks, is actually quite trivial. The reason being that most estimates of sigma, however you interpret it, put it close, quite close to one. So you're not gonna get much mileage out of these blue terms. But in addition, you have a separable set of orange terms. And these orange terms is where this task content comes in. Now the orange terms looks a little bit complicated, the division of an integral by the sum of two integrals, but take this case in which either sigma is exactly one or these gamma L and gamma Zs are equal to one, then this becomes N minus I, new tasks minus automation. So what does this imply for labor? Well, one way of understanding the implications for labor is look at the wage bill. And if you look at wage bill, that's trivially labor output times labor share. That's why I said, if you have productivity effect, the labor share doesn't change, that's great for labor. That's uh, always the case with competitive markets. And even if you don't compare, have competitive markets, that's generally the case. So now let's look at other automation. It does create this productivity effect. That's this green area, but it's very small. So when the cost of producing with capital and labor are similar, this is gonna be generally very small. 
but it then creates a big displacement effect. It also highlights that because of this displacement effect, automation, though it increases productivity, can reduce the wage bill, can make workers less employed and get paid less. And this will in particular be the case with what Pasquale Restrepo and I call so-so technology. Technologies that are good enough to be adopted, but not so good that they generate a big productivity. If you have really brilliant technologies, if AI was so transformative that it was going to increase the productivity of firms in the tasks that are taken over by AI by, uh, by, by, by twofold or reduce costs by 50%, 60%, 70%, that would actually be probably not so bad for labor. But if AI saves 5% of the cost or 10%, that's going to be disastrous for labor. That's the social technology. On the other hand, if you have new tasks, that's very different. It creates a productivity effect, which would be larger. And it also creates a reinstatement effect. It creates new tasks in which labor is reinstated. The reason why I'm emphasizing new tasks is that if you only had the automation effect, as you can see from here, is that labor share always would decline. This is, again, you can see it from here. So if history was one of just automation, we would have a downward trend in labor share forever. Now, the interpretation that I'm going to give, and I'm going to show you some data in a second to back this up, is that the reason why that hasn't happened is exactly because of this reinstatement effect, because of these new tasks. Now, before I turn to the data, let me pause and see if there are some questions at this stage. I think we have any uh, clarification questions here. Doing great. <laughs> okay, great. So let me now try to make the case that these forces that I have highlighted theoretically are actually operative and important in the US. So to do that, let me look at first the labor share in the US. Now a little bit more disaggregated between broad sectors, manufacturing, construction, services, transport, mining, and agriculture. Between 1947 and 1987, these are actually, you know, there's a lot of automation going on, as we'll see, as I'll show you in a second. But these, these are fairly constant. And the reason I will argue in a second is because automation wasn't the only type of technological change. Now let's look at the more recent period. And importantly, this is actually labor share in those sectors in value added, not in sales. If you do this in sales, you'll get the wrong answer because in share of intermediates is changing across sectors. You see that in many sectors, services and transport, uh, you know, big part of GDP, labor share is still fairly constant, but driven especially by manufacturing, a little bit by transport and by mining, you have big declines in labor share. This decline in manufacturing, which goes from about 60% about to about almost 46%, is actually accounts for most of the aggregate change in the labor share. So that's actually very relevant. You know, during this period, we have Walmart, we have, uh, you know, uh, big retailers, changes in the nature of services, for-profit hospitals becoming bigger, but that's not really changing the services labor share. It's all being driven by manufacturing. So that already says you have to look at something that's really happening much faster in manufacturing than elsewhere. And in fact, one thing that's happening much faster in manufacturing is automation. So here I'm showing you a couple of measures of automation. Uh, these diamonds are manufacturing. These are robots. Robots are almost entirely in manufacturing. And you can see that the more robots a sector adopts, the greater is the decline in the labor share. Routine tasks are those that are being automated, the evidence suggests. They're not the only ones being automated, by the way, but, but let's focus on those for a second. And now you have routine tasks in services as well as in manufacturing, and you see that uh, the more routine tasks you have in manufacturing, the more the labor share declines. The more routine tasks you have in services, the more the labor share declines. But again, it's really a manufacturing phenomenon more than a services phenomenon. And here you go much, much more detailed to uh, about 400 uh, more detailed industries in manufacturing in a subset of manufacturing industries where we can measure these automation technologies and you see the same relationship. The more automation, the lower is the labor. Interestingly, if you do the same thing with measures of new tasks, which I'm not going to get into because I don't have the time, but perhaps Joshua will be 
nice enough to mention some of these issues in the, in his discussion on new tasks because I think those are interesting things and Joshua himself has thought about some of them in decision making etc. But whatever, however measure of uh, however we measure new tasks in the work with Pasquale, we have a couple of measures. We always find that more new task adoption is associated with increases in labor shares in line with the theme. But let me look at the data a little bit more carefully before sort of putting everything together. Let's look at something that could be a little bit more clearly interpreted as a causal estimate. So to do that, I'll turn to another paper that I have with Pasquale Restrepo uh, on the effects of robots on jobs. And here we look at robot penetration across different commuting zones according to their baseline industry structure. And we take the robot penetration by industry and create a Bartik-like measure of exposure to robots. Here is the data across 722 commuting zones. On the horizontal axis, we have exposure to robots. On the vertical axis, we have the number of integrators in the commuting zone. And you, you need the integrators for the robots. And you see that, indeed, this exposure to robots captures greater robotics-related activity. We also know from other sources, including our own work that, and, and work by other people in this audience, that robot adoption is very good for productivity in general. So if you have the classic view that technological change over at least a period of 20 to 30 years, when it increases productivity should benefit labor, you should see more robot adoption, better outcomes for labor. But we find exactly the opposite. In places that have adopted more robots, employment is much lower. This is emblematically illustrated by the industrial heartland of the United States, places like Detroit, Lansing, uh, Toledo, and so on. But it's not driven by it. If you leave those places out and cut the data here, for example, or here, you get the solid line rather than the dashed line, sorry, the dashed line rather than the solid line. And the same thing is exactly true when you look at wages. In places where there are more robots being adopted, wages are significantly lower for worker com composition adjustment. And all of this is driven by exactly the displacement of workers in these routine tasks that are performed by robots. Robots don't perform the office ta tasks, they perform the blue color tasks. And so you see routine manual operator assemblies, you know, inspectors and production tasks declining in places where you have the robots. These, I think are fairly good candidates for being interpreted as causal estimates. There are no trends, they're very robust and they're not driven by competing changes like software, China trade, offshoring, et cetera. As they, these tend to be fairly orthogonal to the sorts of variation that we're looking at. So this is just an illustration of what's going on. One thing that I don't have time to talk about is the topic of a new paper that Pasquale and I have just put out as an MBR working paper a couple of weeks ago is that these exact changes that I'm focusing on, both the robotics related and software related displacements also explains most of the increased changes in the US wage inequality. So what used to be interpreted as skill bias technological change because technology augments the productivity of skilled labor, we show is to a first approximation almost entirely, not because these new technologies of the last 30 years have augmented the productivity of skilled workers, but they have directly harmed unskilled workers, especially the unskilled workers that used to perform routine tasks or other automatable tasks in sectors undergoing automation. So again, really what's going on in the labor market at a broader level that economists used to try to understand or still mostly perhaps interpret with a neoclassical factor augmenting technological lens really should be viewed as a consequences of the changes in the task. But why now? As I said, automation has been going on forever since 1750. And it was, I hinted at, it was already rapid in, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the 50s and the 60s. Well, it's not AI. AI really picks up, these are figures from recent work I have with Joe Hazel, David Otter, and Pasquale Restrepo using burning glass. AI really picks up after 2002. So the question when it comes to AI, and this includes big data, machine learning, and other AI activities, is really whether it's going to change the trend of automation or augment it, go down in the same direction. So to do that, we look at various measures of which are the tasks that are replaceable by AI using uh, Felton, 
<coughs> at Al's measure, uh, Eric Brunjolufsen, um, Tom Mitchell, and Daniel Rock's SML, suitability for machine learning measure, and Michael Webb's measure based on patterns. With all of these measures, we see that the pickup in AI activity is explained almost entirely by the fourth, or with this one with the third and the fourth quartile of the establishments when they are ranked according to how many AI replaceable tasks they have. So it very, looks very much like AI is going to places where it can replace workers. But what about employment? Well, we can't observe employment, but we can observe hiring or vacancies. So we see that exactly those that are hired, that are posting the AI vacancies, the blue and the green, are posting many fewer other vacancies and relative compared to the rest. And the AI vacancies they post are very, very small. So it doesn't really change. You know, that's not employment creation. That's just more like AI activity. So it looks like very much AI is going down the path of automation. This has some implications, which I'm going to come and put together the whole thing together. So then let's look at why is it that AI is going down this path? To do this, I'm going to turn to a different way of looking at the data at a more macro level and say, well, how come uh, how come in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, you had automation, but labor share was constant, wages were increasing, inequality was fairly stable. And to do that, we do a decomposition using industry level data uh, at either aggregated or fine level, and try to break down the implied types of technological change into displacement coming from automation and the restatement coming from the new task. Then there is a fourth category, which is these labor augmenting and capital augmenting technological changes, they are so trivial, I'm not even showing them to you. And the bottom line is that between 1947 and 1987, there was a lot of automation, but there, it was counterbalanced by a lot of new tasks or other types of technologies that help labor. So much so that if you look at the sum of the two, which I'm gonna call change in ta task content, that's hovering around zero. So that's essentially saying there is no change in labor share coming from this technological source. There might be other changes, but they're small, it turns out. But, and the same is true, not just for the entire economy, but for manufacturing as well. A lot of automation, but a lot of counterbalancing other technological sources. Now let's look at the more recent 30 years or so. You see that the red now goes all, more negative. Sorry yes. to interrupt. Yes. Uh, it'd be good to uh, you know, wrap up in a few minutes. Yes, yes, perfect. Uh, the red one accelerates while the blue one slows down. It's even more sharply true in the red, oh, sorry, in the manufacturing than the other way around. Now, why is this happening? Well, there could be two reasons for it. Somehow the innovation possibilities frontier has shifted that the efficient way in which you deploy new technologies is going to be much more towards automation than new tasks. Or the innovation possibilities hasn't shifted all that much, but we're moving along it to a point that's less efficient, puts much more emphasis on automation. And I think the innovation possibilities hasn't changed. There's quite a bit of evidence for why that hasn't changed and why the incentives to move along it have changed. Uh, I don't have the time to get into it, but some of it institutional, some of it is related to policy, for example, in terms of how capital and labor is taxed. But most importantly, I believe is two corporate finance, corporate organizational changes. One is firms have become much more attentive to cost reduction. So when they used to view labor as a resource, it would make much more sense to increase the productivity of labor. Today, they view labor as a cost. So it makes much more sense to reduce labor because you're reducing your cost. Second, the direction of technology has become dominated by a handful of companies such as Google, Facebook, Netflix, Amazon, whose business model is very much centered on automation. And quite tellingly, these companies are even more dominant for AI than other digital technologies of the last 15, 20 years. As a result, now I think we are in the realm of what I would call excessive automation. And let's go back to the figure that I showed you to explain what excessive automation is. So this is the real opportunity cost of labor. So you should never go beyond this point of intersection. But if the perceived cost is higher, either because you don't like labor, which these companies don't, that's their ideology, or because you're subsidized to adopt capital, that's what the US tax code does, 
or your management practices have changed because your MBA trained uh, managers start viewing labor as a cost, then you would go somewhere like this. But now this red triangle is negative. So you're actually not just not getting much productivity effect, you're getting negative productivity effect in terms of PFT, not in terms of labor price. If that's the case, and I'm concluding now, Will, then it becomes imperative that we create countervailing incentives and countervailing powers to stop automation. There are many ways of doing that, and I'm sure Joshua will talk about them, so let me not get too much into it. But it is fundamentally about redirecting technological change. So a lot of evidence, in my opinion, both quantitative and qualitative, suggests that technology is highly malleable. It can be redirected. This is doubly true for AI because it's a very broad platform. Joshua's own work emphasizes that. So as a broad platform, I think there's no reason for AI to go more and more in an automation direction. It can be go and can go in a very complementary direction. And we also know, even though many economists, I'm sure some people in this audience are going to be skeptical, we also know that government policy is actually very successful in general in redirecting technological change. Even small government interventions can lead to fairly large changes in the direction of technological change. One example of that comes from renewable energy where small subsidies and small carbon taxes globally have led to a huge change in the direction of technological change, bringing renewable energy to cost effectiveness with fossil fuels, something that 40 years ago, nobody would have thought possible. So conclusion, I think we really have to distinguish between good automation and bad or so-so automation. Good automation is the one that increases productivity and is often goes in hand in hand with other types of technological change. It's part of a broad, portfolio. Good automation wouldn't be using AI and big data just to re replicate tasks that humans do. It would be ways of finding, good ways of finding complementary uses. Incidentally, just emphasizing that, again, this is feasible, early leaders in this area of machine intelligence, people like Engelbart, Lackweiler, uh, Wiener, were all of the view that AI, or what we now recognize as AI, should be used for complementing humans. It was only something that later developed uh, and became crystallized by the business models of very peculiar business models of some tech companies that we came to view artificial intelligence as something that's completely autonomous that replicates human activities and eliminates humans. So I think there's a lot of room for redirecting technological change and creating good automation. However, I think what we are doing right now is going much more in the direction of bad and so-so automation, excessively automating, not creating much productivity gain. And if that's the case, the future of labor is bleak. The social implications of this are dire. I don't have the time to get into it, but perhaps we can talk about them in the, in the Q&A. I don't think it's something you can correct by things like universal basic income or a better social safety net. I don't think there's any substitute in current human society for using the labor market as a nexus of greater inclusivity. But let me stop here and I look forward to hearing Joshua's comments and your suggestions and questions later on. Thank you. Thank you very much for the fantastic talk. Uh, Joshua is going to discuss the presentation. You're muted, Joshua. I'm, I'm muted, sorry. Thanks for letting me come here. Um, this uh, topic is a, uh, is a fascinating one. Um, apparently we have not uh, worked out how to automatically unmute anyone yet. So there's some things we aren't worried about. Uh, I, I and and I, I you know there's a lot of issues uh, that are raised to it. Um, 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 the one I want to focus on is sort of like we're playing this exercise of trying to forecast the immediate future for the purposes of policy and what we should do about it. Um, and this is very very challenging. It's like building the plane in real time. Um, so what I want to do is give a perspective of how I think about it and and. In contrast to Duran, I come from a different direction. I come from the direction of, you know, I see hundreds, hundreds. I mean, uh, and that's 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 not um, literally, actually. Um, uh, that's actually had hundreds of startups in AI, and I don't quite see uh, what Duran is seeing in the aggregate data. Um, but you know, uh, but uh, you know, uh, and uh, you know, there there are different ways of looking at these things. But I want to give a sense of where I come from here. So. The Asimoglu and Restrepo kind of broad approach to all this is uh, starts off with this great thing that, uh, that I appreciate very much is that innovation at the task level involves taking a task and substituting a person for a machine. It's not one of these 
labor augmenting capital augmenting sort of miracles that occur it sort of goes all the way back to atkinson and stiglitz who said you know there's something about the context of what you happen to be dealing with right now that might matter and it matters for the direction of technological change and so that's really the hook that gets you in here it is a <clears throat> new view of how uh, uh, the direction of technological change work and 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 interestingly we should note this in contrast to the we'll call it the first half of Duron's uh, career is a marked departure from uh, the previous approaches that were being used to look at that. Um, the uh, uh, results are basically that AI automation could be welfare reducing if the displacement effect outweighs the productivity effect. Um, so it's more possible for so-so innovations that have a low productivity effect than brilliant ones that have a, a high one. Um, this can also be counterbalanced by the creation of new tasks, um, which is, of course, a, uh, you know, in the theory was a, yes, if we create new tasks, of course, we could do it in working out whether it's actually occurring. That's a whole other matter. And what it might look like is really challenging. The empirical exercise backing up all of this is to forecast all of these effects. Um, you know, we, we use the history to explain the past, but we're trying to work out what's different this time. And so we're trying to get some forward indicators on it. And so past changes in labor tend to have been driven by this change in task composition, which is suggestive of displacement. And, and uh, there are magnified distortions when you have this, uh, uh, things, uh, capital and labor distortions, uh, subsidies to capital or costs to labor. And these all get magnified here. Uh, so the policy response, as Daron already said, is uh, to use government. Government has to change the direction of AI research. This is when it comes quite controversial because you just have to say, why isn't the market doing this? And it comes back to these distortions, of course. Um, and the direction has to move from away from human replacement and to human augmentation. There are lots of, that's not an unknown thing. The, 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 uh, in, the computer scientists have, uh, have uh, in the last few years, definitely hopped on that bandwagon and are seeing that more fruitful. Uh, again, wondering whether we need the government to do so or not. Now, the broad thing is here is like trying to understand what is the problem? <laughs> and the problem arises in, in, in general equilibrium. And it was noted by Herbert Simon um, now seven, 60 or 70 years ago um, in this book called The Shape of Automation for Men and Management. And, and he came up with a, a beautiful proof uh, of something that others have independently done, including Duron later on, which is basically saying that you you take a you take a um, uh, 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 production function, it, output is basically uh, your income is is labor, the labor income plus capital income. Um, the general equilibrium condition that drives all this is that. Uh, if this is the labor requirement and this is the capital requirement and we set the final good price equal to one, uh, wages and interest rates uh, must satisfy this condition. So if you get a new technique, um, and it can be one of a new technique arising because of task-based automation going on, um, uh, if uh, these new technique involves a lower um, left-hand side, um, the only thing that adjusts is the wage bill. So wages go up because uh, the interest rates are governed by things like uh, consumer intertemporal substitution and stuff like that. So if you're going to get a lower wage, it does require effectively that the capital requirement actually goes up. That's how you can get a, a lower wage in, in these models. And, that's, and, and, you know, I haven't had a chance to sort of look and see whether that's what's going on in a certain Restrepo, but I suspect it is. Uh, you're getting this excessive automation because you're ultimately choosing a, uh, a sort of kind of worse production function <laughs> uh, uh, from that. Um, and so that's at the heart of this. Why do you get that? That's the welfare harm. Incentives to adopt inefficient production techniques. And you get this diagram that, that was already shown. So the question is, is adopted AI going to involve less produ efficient production? Are there three reasons to think that that will, will occur? I mean, a lot of us actually had things like good automation. This is an example of it. We had taxis. Taxis drivers were skilled. They knew where to go. They knew how to drive. Um, in in in, they, in uh, London, they had to spend four years doing this, learning that that particular skill of where to go. Then along comes this, and any idiot can now can now work out where to go in London. Um, so what have you done? You've empowered. You've basically 
automated one task in driving that is predicting where to, working out where to go is now automated and it's now distributed essentially for free to everybody so everybody who had the skill of driving can now be as good as a london cab driver and not surprising the london cab drivers hate that <laughs> right but 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 from the point of view of automating this particular task this is likely employment created there are many more drivers uh, 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 in this in this particular market now because basically you've You've, you've done a task-based innovation that is complementary to a skill that a lot of people have. And so that's expanded the market. So it's likely good automation. Um, of course, AI is different from automation, something we emphasized in our book, Prediction Machines, where basically the AI component is really just, if you take a task and it involves prediction and involves actually doing the thing. Um, <laughs> uh, so dealing with uncertainty and then actually reacting to it. What AI is doing is dropping the cost of prediction. Um, so if you substitute a machine for a human in how you predict various variables or how you sense the world or any of those sorts of things uh, to make decisions more accurate, uh, that's a form of, of substitution going on. But the entire task doesn't get automated. It's this one aspect of it. Uh, and so the question you, you have to ask yourself is, you know, we, we're, automate, we're, we're using machines for prediction. The question is, when does that lead to you also using machines for the action? Because it's both of those things that is automation. In order to automate a full task, you've can't, you, with AI, you, AI helps you with one bit, but you've got this other bit that has to be done. Um, and it's, you know, is it obvious that that's going to be the case? And the thing we emphasize, the sort of the missing ingredient is this part, judgment. You can have a great prediction and stuff like that, but all of the sort of trade-offs and nuances and loss functions and everything else has to come from a person. There's no machine that can currently work out what the objective function is, program it into stuff and, and let that go. So either someone is using the prediction and it's using it as a tool or alternatively, someone has worked out what people should do in each given situation and can program it into a machine. And that's kind of what's happening with self-driving cars. The difference between dealing with judgment on the spot and dealing with it in a program thing is you get your software equals it's the world type situation and you can have uh, 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 the distribution of that judgment occur at scale which allows a lot more automation going on um, and so this is what we emphasized in a chapter in the book that uh, on the economics of AI uh, previous conference so AI provides prediction automation involves prediction and the action being done you're, you're going to have to hard code your judgment in order to build a fully automated thing, which is easy if it's a very simple machine, but harder as it gets more complicated. And so automation, you know, is going to require this judgment being done by someone centralized and pushed out to everybody else. Um, and does that mean it's going to be more beneficial at lower complexity? One would say likely, which is something that gets hand waved by Deron and, 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 and co-authors. Um, so, but, but nonetheless comes out of this. And, but the innovation, and this is what I want to focus on, is you have to take this task and you add AI. If you still have to rely on the human to exercise judgment, uh, that's going to be an augmenting innovation. If the judgment's already hard COVID coded, then that's going to allow for full substitution. In other words, if all the person was doing was 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 um, predicting, <laughs> then that's going to allow for full automation. Um, um, and that's why you know, and all the examples of companies that Duron talked about are ones where there's very little individual discretion going on in those jobs that are, are automated because people already tell them what to do. So this implies that your sort of pure wage and cost drivers, uh, wage to capital price and stuff, is always going to be often going to be associated with centralized judgment. But when judgment is also coded, uh, where judgment is also coded, um, um, uh, you'll get this productivity effect as well. The other thing I want to briefly emphasize, I won't talk about this too much, is, is there are system-wide effects to this um, in, uh, as you get to different environments. It's not just automating one task, it's automating the collection of tasks throughout the organization. Well, or, or, or if you adopt AI in one task, the uh, question is, what does that mean to other tasks and how you have a production system go, go ahead? I, I don't want to go too much into it because I know we have short of time, 
But this is what this system effect is what's missing in all of these studies <laughs> that are currently trying to work out what is AIable, what is automated. It's very much task decentralized level, which can be useful, but there's going to be a big correlated order, organizational effect. And in fact, what our research suggests is that one thing that comes from adopting things like AI that have intrinsically more variability and complexity to them is if you have to coordinate across more tasks in order to make things happen and to leverage that, you're going to have to have more coordination devices, communication and so on. But what does that mean? More meetings uh, uh, like this one, this is, this is the good sort of meeting or you could have the other sort of meeting. One thing about <laughs> meetings that, that is very true and I wish it wasn't true currently um, is that it involves people. People are spending a lot more time meeting. But the one thing I'd like to see if I had to throw it out there for people who are doing these studies of AI adoption and all that, uh, are you getting a whole lot more people in meetings <laughs> in these organizations that are adopting AI? I would like to know. Um, but there isn't that much difference between tasks and systems. I'm going to flip over this um, uh, in terms of, you know, the broader effects. But there is a difference in sort of the pace. And so my stress here is to say, I think what is very important here is when the innovator is working on bringing AI to a task, what's really driving them. And it is true, when AI first appeared, we're only talking a few years ago now, um, uh, people were very focused on cost of labor. I mean, every business plan would say, here's how much labor you can save, until they realized they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it because the AI was, it was not, it, it, it takes a lot of work to replace a whole job. It does take a lot of work. If your job is already very mechanical, and we already knew this from past automation, no problem. But what if it isn't? <laughs> and, and usually for most people, 80% uh, uh, of the time, but only 20% of the, uh, but, uh, is 80% of the time is, um, is uh, based on routine tasks. But 80% of the cognitive load that they're bringing to the job is based on exceptions. So uh, that changes how we think about replacing jobs. Um, and so are these going to be motivated by saving labor slots? If so, you're going to get frustrated unless you can hard code judgment, which is only going to happen to the simplest and more isolated of tasks thus far. Um, the costs are going to be higher than expected if your organization isn't modular. Uh, and I think that is one of the reasons why this initial data going back for five years is showing these effects. Well, because the first place you adopt AI and automation is where you already have modularity. And so that's where, of course, you'll see some of this substitution. But what we're trying to do is forecast what is that going to mean for the corpus of jobs and are we going to have to worry about policy and displacement and all the other social things that people worry about. If they're motivated by productivity or value, then it's a very different story because then you have to justify adopting it. And also you're sort of starting to align incentives for picking better production functions rather than worse production functions. And so there's an extra leap that you have to do to make all this happen, which is going to bias you towards better AI <laughs> and better automation, I think. Um, in other words, that I think there's still reason to believe that yeah, absent distortions and other things like that, people will focus on bigger hits to productivity. Um, which is more likely? Of course, we don't know. I'm just putting forward some, I'll, I'll be admittedly loose, and I hope to um, provide a more clear example of this having been motivated by this, preparing this discussion at a future time. But we really, uh, it's a really tough game being played at the moment. <laughs> There's a wealth of information being brought by Duran and others uh, to suggest a, a concern, um, persuasive concern that causes us to really change stuff. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not yet persuaded, but uh, you know, we, we have to think more through this to make that case. Okay. Thank you, Joshua, for the uh, great discussion. Now we have some time for the uh, Q&A. Uh, please feel free to type your question into the Q&A box. Um, I'll start with one um, question um, Eric posed. Um, Eric was saying, uh, your, your evidence, uh, Donna, your evidence is very compelling. Can you say more about how we can identify and encourage technologies that are less likely to automate human labor, more likely to complement it or spur the creation of new tasks? 
basically what, what do you propose for redirecting technological change in that particular direction? Um, there are, feel free to uh, also respond to uh, Joshua's uh, comments as well. Okay, well, I think, uh, thanks, thanks, Will. Thank you, Joshua, for those thought-provoking comments. Uh, and Eric put his finger on you know, the most challenging aspects. So I'll say something about that. But, you know, uh, let me just say one, one word about Joshua's excellent discussion. You know, uh, I think the system-wide effects are very important. Uh, we should talk again in about two years time because I'm trying to work more on some of these things, but the inefficiency that you've identified or you've talked about cannot be separated from those system-wide effects. So in some sense, I think an implicit assumption in your discussion, Joshua, was that somehow those system-wide effects are productivity enhancing. But I think it's very easy to imagine several pathways by which those system-wide effects are productivity deteriorating because of the organizations that we change and we try to use technology more for rent extraction rather than for increasing productivity. And also we make mistakes. Research is not done with a perfect understanding of what the future holds. I think ideology, views, uh, beliefs, priorities matter both among researchers and companies. And I'm not willing to say although most economists are, that somehow those mistakes are going to wash out. So the aggregate innovation is always going to be in the direction that's most productive in terms of increasing welfare. I think that generally doesn't follow and it follows less and less when a few companies become so dominant in terms of their uh, influence on the future of technology. But this immediately transitions into Eric's question. Okay, fine. But how do we actually identify those things? Well, I think if we leave AI aside, I think there are two ways that are complementary in which you can try to identify whether a technology is more automating or more human complementary. It is, first of all, the nature of the technology is very clear. So if you look at, sort of, for example, the patent descriptions, technologies that are automating often have some very specific tasks that they mention together with machines substituting for those tasks. This is exactly how, for example, Michael Webb's measure sort of is coded just using it, the abstracts of patents. There is a wealth, wealth of information to patents that's not as even beyond the abstract, but, but you can sort of see quite a bit. And you also know what automating technologies do in terms of outcome. They tend to reduce labor share. So, so you can easily combine these two sorts of information in order to identify which ones are really introducing new tasks and increasing the labor share versus which ones are uh, essentially targeting and effectively replacing things and reducing the labor share. Uh, and I think new tasks are, are very, very, you know, uh, Joshua also mentioned, you know, how do we recognize new tasks? Yeah, perhaps in the moment that might be hard, but if you look at it with just a little bit of distance, you know, I would say, I often suggest the following thought experiment to, to the audience. So let me do it the same. Just think of everybody you know and ask the following question. Do the main tasks, main, main occupation that they are engaged in exist 60 years ago? And if it existed, do the tasks that they perform mostly existed in that occupation 60 years ago? And I think for 80 to 90% of the people that you know, the answer would be no. So management consultants, radiology technicians, app developers, software designers, IT professionals, uh, HR professionals, most of those did not exist 60 years ago. Those that existed, such as journalists, professor, uh, middle manager, actually, if you look at the tasks 60 years ago, the tasks were very, very different. So most of the tasks that we perform as professors were not the things that professors 60 years ago performed. So, so in that sense, new tasks are everywhere and they're technologically mediated. Now, the problem with Eric's question is that, unfortunately, for AI, it's much harder. Because I think AI, because of its broad-based nature, 
exactly the same type of reasoning and advances can be used for automating versus for creating new tasks. So we need a much better measurement framework when it comes to AI. So I think the challenge is deeper for AI. But I would say the reason why today we can measure so much better what technologies reduce carbon emissions versus not is because precisely we invested in developing such a measurement framework in the area of climate technologies or energy technologies. So I think we can easily do the same in the area of labor. Thank you. Thank you, Daron. I think it's perfect timing. And um, it, it's a good time for us to kind of um, just end the official part of the webinar, but let's thank um, our speakers um, and, and discuss them with a big round of uh, virtual applause. And also, before uh, we enter the unrecorded part, I would like to announce that we will be taking a break in July as we have the summer vacational break for everyone. Uh, we will resume our webinars in August. And we're really excited to have an amazing lineup of speakers then, uh, including Susan AC, Jerry Holberg, as well as uh, Eric Benofson. So please, uh, please stay tuned and uh, we hope you can join um, us on our future webinars. Uh, with that, I wish you all a great summer ahead. Remember, we have a informal 15 minutes or so uh, unrecorded discussion going on. So for those who would like to stay, please stay in this Zoom room while we upgrade you to the panelists. Thank you, everyone.